The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Um, welcome everyone to the Stoa. Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the Stoa. The Stoa is a place where, for us to cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this very moment. That's the first time I messed up that line and because I'm nervous because Sarah Perry's here and I was totally fanboying her uh, before we let people in. Um, but I, I said I, I, would, I would contain myself stoically. Um, and you know, dreams do come true because the queen of the post rat, Sarah Perry, has uh, uh, arrived at the Stoa. Uh, for those of you who don't know Sarah, she's the author of the book, uh, Every Cradle is a Grave, uh, and a contributing editor to Ribbon Farm. Um, and how today's gonna work, she's going to present her thoughts on a very uh, quirky title. What's the title again? Recent Results in Ignorance Studies. Um, and it's gonna be maybe uh, 30, 45 minutes, uh, and then we'll pivot to uh, Q&A. We have a time allotted for about 75 minutes, give or take. Um, and for the question uh, and answer format, put your question in chat, I'll call on you, unmute yourself. This will be on YouTube, so indicate that if you don't wanna be on YouTube. That being said, uh, I'll allow everyone to unmute themselves. Sarah, welcome to Stoa. Okay, so I have a giant long presentation with like slides and stuff. And the first part is going to be boring stuff about like science and um, indexicality. And then real quickly, we're going to get into the cool stuff about like beauty and nature. And so I'll, I'll try to get through that part and just get the idea laid for what I want to show with my with my later stuff. So I'm going to try to share my screen to show you my slides. That's going to be fun. Um, all right, so ignorance. I love I love abstract nouns. I love rehabilitating abstract nouns like ignorance and laziness and pettiness. I think all those are great. So uh, this connection is this horrible word we have to get through, indexicality. So this is this, this I, I think, epistemic revolution, this horrible mental change that I've gone through over the past uh, year, I guess. Uh, indexicality um, is kind of the opposite of the usual way we think about knowledge. I think there's this idea of generalization. Um, these are just some, some sources that I'm kind of going from in general. We'll see more of some of these a little bit later. Um, there's this idea of there's just knowledge in general. It's kind of like stuff that's just true, true for all times, like facts, um, true at all places. And that's there's some idea that that's what science is trying to get at, uh, just general knowledge. Um, things that are true forever, everywhere. And the idea of indexicality is that that may be possible in rare situations, but that often that there's a sort of false knowledge of the idea of general knowledge that, that blocks actual learning. So what is indexicality? Your, your index finger is an example. Of, that's where, where this is. Um, Indexicality is like the quality of being referred to in context. So if I use the word this, and I'm referring to something that's right next to me, like this slide, I'm not referring to stuff in general at large in the universe. I'm talking about this particular slide in this moment in this presentation. Um, you might indicate that with pointing with the index finger, that's or, or your tongue or something else, your elbow, uh, your nose and nod of the head. Uh, but it's just this idea that in the speech act and talking, we're bringing something from context into it. And I think there's this idea that that's only a weird type of language, that, that most language is just in general. And I think that's wrong. <laughs> that David Chapman, who's, who's my friend, by the way, um, <laughs> wrote in his book, uh, In the Cells of the Eggplant, I love this example. I just think this really brings it home. His, his title the, the, of this chapter is The Purpose of Meaning is to Get Stuff Done. Um, Almost any word can be used to mean almost anything in some context. You could play this as a challenge game, like how can you get some word to mean something? How about the eggplant is a straw hat and the spinach is yelling about politics? Well, here's, here's the context that makes that make sense. We're in the kitchen of a vegetarian restaurant, a table's entrees are ready and the server who took the orders explaining to the one who will deliver the meal which diner gets which dish. One customer's flamboyant straw hat is a salient, unambiguously identifying feature you can see it all the way across the room. He's the straw hat. That's a person, right? The eggplant is a person and the straw hat's a person. The other probably needs to turn up a hearing aid. You can hear the opinions about cultural appropriation all the way across the room. So that's the spinach. And I think this, this example is just that language is indexical. We're always just 
picking out words to use in this moment without a pause, without having, you know, without thinking about it um, to get the job done in that moment for that particular job. And there's kind of this temptation to see language as just in general knowledge. This is, this is, I've seen uh, Kenneth, Kenneth Lieberman has a whole lecture just on one sentence of Harold Garfinkel, and this is one clause of one sentence of Harold Garfinkel. Um, this is ethnomethodology. And what ethnomethodology is doing is they're not like doing surveys in terms of sociology. They're kind of embedding themselves in environments and trying to figure out how different situations work, like whether that's crossing a street, they're going to be on that street videotaping and looking at people and you know, crossing the street themselves to try to see how that intersection works. They're not gonna be doing you know, surveys or uh, going about you know, intersections in general. Uh, so the distinction that Garfinkel's making here, and I'll just go through this pretty quickly. I could spend 30,000 words on this clause, but this is this idea that there, there are these things called, he makes a distinction between exact sciences and inexact sciences. So I think exact science would be something like bridge building, <laughs> like not necessarily science as we think of it, but um, something like stress or tension, um, tolerances, those are kind of vague terms, but they have to be worked out in real specific ways in order to build a bridge. Whereas in inexact sciences, um, that, that just remains a hope that never really happens. If you're thinking about stress in the sense of like psychological stress or social stress, um, it's, it's really not going to get beyond the abstract noun level. Um, you can do surveys, as we'll see. You can uh, talk about things in particular contexts, but you're probably never going to get that kind of bridge building knowledge about stress and tolerances in in the inexact sciences, partly because those those bridges are are their own context. Like they're kind of realizing there's no such thing maybe as stress or or tension in general. It's only you know how what what uh, do we know these material? What about what do we know about these materials we're building with? Um, what are uh, past situations that we're looking at? So, so getting quite specific about things. And um, that's, that's kind of a distinction between two types of sciences. So it's not that you can never get beyond the indexical, but it's, it's really hard. And it's, it's something that you can't just take for granted as happening. All right, so generalizability. Um, one uh, concept that I've gotten especially mad about in a, in a happy way. I love, I love bad science. Like some people love like bad movies, like, and it's, they're happy when it's like the acting's terrible and the, the plot makes no sense. And the script is all over the place And I love like bad science that way, but um, words don't work that way is my, my sort of summary of, uh, of indexicality that there is no uh, stuff in general. There's no stress in general. There's no uh, depression in general. There's no um, conspiracy thinking, let's say, in general, as we'll see. Um, and I, I like to call this abstract noun abuse for the, the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Abstract Nouns. Um, and these abstract nouns are things like the, the nouns I've been using. Um, things like what well, we'll see, we'll see several as we go, but um, that almost sound kind of technical, like they must have some kind of real technical meaning, but often the meaning as they're being used comes down to some kind of survey, questions that people are being asked in language and then their results kind of tallied up. And it's, it's almost embarrassing how little that connects to the rich abstract noun we might have. Um, and I think we, we often don't think about surveys. I've been thinking about surveys a lot, but how much, how many steps of inference we go in order to see, um, uh, in order to believe in a survey or to take something. I think we hear results of surveys all the time, or you might, you might, some scientific findings you might not even realize they're based on surveys until you drill down on it. So let's let's just look at one of these and kind of point and laugh. Here's the conspiracy mentality questionnaire, and this is this is a validated instrument, and I encourage you to learn about what that means, <laughs> but. Just kind of this is this is nothing. I'm not making fun of it in particular. It's very similar to kind of every other survey instrument that's used to measure abstract nouns, and it's measuring conspiracy mentality. And we can see uh, these questions. Maybe they have something to do with a conspiracy mentality. Um, let's see. 
I like number four, events which superficially seem to lack a connection are often the result of secret activities. So what exactly does that mean? How are the, the people reading this, interpreting it? Um, we have a real precise scale. It's very scientific from 0% to 100%. I think it's interesting. They, they give you the values. So you're, you're saying whether it's certainly not or certain or somewhere in between. And notice how many of these words also, these questions from one to five also have a sort of probability term in them. And I've, I've put on the right here, um, uh, just the results from another survey that's kind of like how people report in terms of percentage probabilities, what different words mean. So for instance, in question four, we have an often lack of a connection or often the result of secret activities. We can kind of say, well, maybe that's somewhere between 60 and 80%. And then you're asked to make a judgment of 0% to 100% based on that. So um, and that's, it's these, these questions we can ask, how much does this really have to do with conspiracy thinking? Um, and, and how much should we trust this? Even if we, we take the very, very large leap and say people answering surveys are telling the truth and can meaningfully access that kind of knowledge about themselves, like what do these questions even mean? I always ask, for survey instrument questions compared to what? Almost every, almost every one of these has this issue. So here's, a, here's some other constructs that, this is just from a recent paper, it doesn't, it's just, they're kind of very similar. I'm not singling it out just other than it's the most recent one I read. Um, so one of, the, one of the things this is testing is conservative versus liberal. So there's some abstract nouns. <laughs> um, and one of the questions overall, where would you place yourself on the following scale of liberalism to conservatism? And it's, at some points they're using a hundred point scale. At some points I think they're using a nine or seven point scale, but I just put a little asterisk like that. And then, so those are abstract nouns. We kind of, well, do people mean the same things by those? Is that even a real thing? Okay, well, we have this numerical data on it. So it must be a real thing. Um, and then they go into more detail. Well, how about social and cultural issues? Abortion, separation of church and state, affirmative action. And that's their issues. I don't know, social and cultural issues, are those the, the biggest issues? Are those the, you know, could people be on different sides on different ones of those? And then the, the economic ones, taxation, welfare, privatization of social security. I don't actually even know which one is conservative or, or liberal for, for privatization of social security, but um, I think often we can get a little bit closer to distrusting surveys and, and, and having some ignorance of the, the evidence they, they give us by just looking at the actual questions and saying, does this connect up? And they are using this to prove, to, to make claims about conspiratorial thinking in general, not just you know, on our little survey with these questions. They're using it to flesh out this abstract noun. They're using it to unpack this abstract noun. Um, I've just highlighted the, the words. I, I don't expect you to read this whole, this whole paragraph. Um, sometimes you'll see some attention in surveys to some problems with surveys, but I rarely, rarely if ever see deep attention to does our survey even mean anything? Like, what is it measuring? Um, this one they reported, they did a few surveys, but one of them, only one of them, they reported an attrition rate. They're all online surveys. It was 22%. So you wonder what kind of conclusions it can draw when one in five people is not even finishing it. Anyway, um, the, and sometimes I'll do, you know, attention checks or something. So it's, it's not nothing, but I don't think it ever gets to the central, is this meaningful? Does this actually unpack to this abstract noun? Um, and they're using it to kind of dunk on conservatives, dunk on the out group and say, oh, conservatives are, are crazy conspiracy theorists. And um, results reveal that conservatives in the United States were not only more likely than liberals to endorse specific conspiracy theories, uh, they're also more likely to espouse conspiratorial worldviews in general. And we have some statistical information there, so we know it must be true. Um, and actually what made, me, what made me laugh the most about this paper, I've written about uh, conspiracy theories. I think it's really fun, but first thing they do is give us a definition, which I think, you know, you can't, you can't just give a short definition because you kind of know how problematic it is if you've thought about it. But um, so one, one technique I like to use is just to notice the abstract nouns. And I've highlighted a few of the abstract nouns here just to say, we're making statements about all these things. Every one of these has to unpack in some way. Um, how does it unpack? Is it a survey? Is it a laboratory protocol? Is it you know diagnostic criteria? They're very similar in shape. So I've, I just, in yellow, I've highlighted, they, they've mentioned the troubling consequences of conspiratorial thinking 
uh, including hostility against outgroups. I think it's funny because this is basically the whole purpose of this paper is to dunk on the outgroup. <laughs> like, but anyway, um, all of these, all of these are just noticing abstract nouns, noticing um, what kind of concepts are being brought in and how how those concepts might actually be found or play out. So um, let's see. So, all right, I'll just uh, continue with this. So it's fun to complain about this bad science. This is the end of the boring part. Um, can I, can you actually do anything with this? Is this just, you know, am I just saying information in general about the fact that information in general doesn't exist? Um, can you communicate this on its own terms? And I've been really excited about YouTube lately. I've, I've been saying things like YouTube is the most important form of art right now. I really think it is. Uh, and it's this, this thing, I think you've had Samo Burya on here before talking about uh, tacit knowledge communication, just demonstrating problem solving and stuff that uh, you can't necessarily communicate in words, but when you watch someone do it, or you, you watch them, especially solving problems as they go, uh, so much is communicated in that. And I think of this as the indexical mode that, that you're in when you're solving a real problem versus the sort of in general at large mode, which I think is mostly useless. Um, and last, last little, little quotation, this will be the last of the scholarly stuff. This is from John Dewey's The Quest for Certainty. And he doesn't use, I can't find a synonym for indexical in his work, but he uses a lot of antonyms. And I think he's on about the same thing. Um, just gonna read a little bit. Uh, the scientist finds no help in determining the probable truth of some proposed theory by comparing it with a standard of absolute truth and immutable being. And I think that's the, the opposite of indexical, absolute truth, immutable being. He has to rely on definite operations undertaken under definite conditions upon method. We can hardly imagine an architect getting aid in the construction of a building from an ideal at large. That's kind of the opposite of indexical. Though we can understand his framing an ideal on the basis of knowledge of actual conditions and needs, nor does the ideal of perfect beauty in antecedent being give direction to a painter in producing a particular work, work of art. Uh, he's solving problems. He's not talking about beauty in general. Okay, so I'll, I'll move on from there. So, so this is the ignorance that I'm on about. Um, I'm promoting <laughs> ignorance of, in general, at large, immutable, uh, the sort of getting an ignorance that you wouldn't have had to have if you hadn't you know, gone to school and learned that there's this thing as, as in general knowledge, um, to reveal the specific and real in relation to a particular context instead of problems. So, I use words like unreading, unseeing, we're gonna do some unlearning, um, that getting at the specifics is a way of, of uh, getting out from under the, the obstacle, the, the problem of general knowledge. So I do this humble little craft. This is like, what, what can I do? I'm just a generalist. I don't know about anything. I, I knit and I spin yarn and that's my main, my thing. So if, if this can, can uh, help me here, then maybe that's that's at least something I can use this as, as an example. So one one thing is when you have this silly hobby, and maybe this is true of other hobbies too, you kind of like, why do I do this? <laughs> and one perfectly good answer is for pleasure, like coloring, jigsaw puzzles, paint by number, maybe video games for the experience of doing it, that that's what it's about. There's nothing wrong with that. I think it's wonderful. Like dancing can be can be that. There's uh, there's a lot of reasons to do things just just because they're fun. Um, the weirder one is when you when you start to get good and you're kind of there's this there's this other question of what am I doing this for if you're trying to make something useful because often it's the case that what you're doing uh, the final product will be comparable to something you could just get at a store for a lot cheaper <laughs> the materials and the time. Are, are almost create this paradox. Like, why would I even bother doing this? Um, and I kind of had this question, can it, can it be anything else than that? Uh, is, can there be some kind of elevated knitting or uh, some kind of approach of, of something else in this? So next one, this is my sick fashion. I'm so glad I, I uh, saved this, this photo. This is the height of my utilitarian phase of knitting. Um, this is, kind of indexical in a way because it's the thing you can do that you can't buy on the market is something that's perfectly fitted to you. So there's the sweater and the shawl and the leg warmers are all, all things that I made. And uh, the, the thing that the market can't do is make something that's an exact 
match to your body and your needs. So the exact length of the of the cuff, the, the hem that's kind of dropped on the bottom so it covers your butt. And you know, it's exactly the the diameter of your your different body parts. Um, so that was that was kind of as far as I could go with that. And I learned that you know I could make socks that are better than the socks you could buy. I can make you know knit tights out of sock yarn that are very, very good, but you know, there's only there's only so much of that. So I kind of exhausted that. And this is this is the height of my exhausting of that. But then there's this problem, and that's that's this. Um, I live in the, the Northern Sierra, the high desert, and you're just constantly seeing complete bullshit like this, like this orange light of dawn. This I'm sitting in a tree taking this picture, the mountains, the sky, this, this sagebrush. And if you go out of town a little bit, you see crap like this, like just stuff that hurts your heart and you, you want to find some way to express it. At least I did over and over again. And uh, it's just, it creates this sort of buildup of tension of seeing these things. Um, and, the, and these photographs don't really capture it. Like they, they're little, because they were memorials of what it was like, but they don't capture the sense of space and what what's all together. Like these are one little rectangular view of what's there. Uh, if you go to Lake Tahoe, you see stuff like this. And, um, you know, what do, what do you do with that? I mean, total, total bullshit like this. If you go up on a mountain and look at Lake Tahoe, um, so for me, in a pretty, pretty artistically limited, not much of an artistic background, I would come up with stuff like this. This is my, my way of uh, expressing the dawn early on. And I, I only recently finished this kind of as a dunk on myself because I knew it wasn't, it wasn't what I wanted it to be. But this was my early approximation of here's, here's expressing nature, what that means. And it's all kind of the same color. It has some little dragonflies on it. Um, kind of looks like something your grandmother would make. I don't know the. I wouldn't say it has good color harmony. I've, I took this picture in the golden hour. I don't think it it even helped that much. I gave it every chance. Um, so this is. I would say this is a failure because I made it. I know what problem I was trying to solve, and I know it didn't solve that. I don't hate this. I think it has kind of a cute, like folk art look to it. Like I don't. I don't mind this at all. And it, it's not trivial because you make. I do little tests. Like this dragonfly was a study. This, these little frogs were a study, and the head didn't work. So. These guys have better, more attached heads. But anyway, um, so let's let's talk about cephalopods. This isn't a cephalopod. Um, <laughs> one thing that I've been thinking a lot about lately is cuttlefish. Uh, this isn't a cuttlefish. This is just somebody who has some of the same abilities. And what they do, that you can put them on anything ugly and they somehow make something beautiful out of it. Like they're used to blending into nature. There's nothing really ugly in nature. So they just can't make these these rectangular patterns, but they make this beautiful. He looks like a Rothko to me. Like he's so beautiful. Um, and so I was thinking, like, why? What are they doing? Why can can I use that somehow? Um, one of the questions is, what does a cuttlefish look like? And cuttlefish are these kind of Cthulhu-looking uh, cephalopods that have a bunch of tentacles on their face. But the answer is, it depends on where they are. It depends on their environment because they they blend in, they camouflage unless they're in the mating season or or hypnotizing their prey or something. They camouflage themselves so they look like whatever's around. Um, and I think I think there's something about that that's true. Something like that is true of people as well. That uh, what do people like look like? Well, it depends on what 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 culture they're in. It depends on where they are and what their circumstances are. Okay, so here's a cuttlefish. I think he's beautiful. Um, there's this guy, Julian Baumgartner, uh, who restores paintings on YouTube. And I noticed this similarity that he's, when he's retouching a painting, like he'll have a painting that somebody's nose is missing, or there's just spots of paint missing. And he's retouching them with paint. He says he's, he's not painting, he's disguising the damage. And it's, it struck me he's solving a similar problem to what the cuttlefish are doing. They're trying to sort of make, make it repair a hole in nature, like make, make things whole. And they're using similar methods. Um, they're disrupting the damage with lines. Well, that's what he's doing sometimes. Like if there's a big splotch, maybe he'll, and there's a line on the painting that goes through it, there's a line to sort of uh, disguise the, the damage that's all one block. Uh, using little dots of color for modeling. You can see this guy doing a little of that. Uh, matching a smooth area of color, including sometimes matching the damage. So whatever the painting looks like, if he's not gonna fix everything, matching it so it looks like the older parts of the painting. Uh, I found that to be a pretty, uh, provocative metaphor I like that um, so he's, he's trying to make things whole the cuttlefish is also trying to make things whole kind of almost trying to erase itself 
from vision by looking like nature. So he's since he's disguising a hole in nature, his tricks might give us information. So I have this idea that maybe I, I found myself when I try to copy things uh, and fail, then I then I see them better. Now I know what's not there. So I think there's there's some of that in him. Uh, these are the the three basic patterns that cuttlefish do, <laughs> um, which are I think is a cool abstract noun or set of abstract nouns. There's a disruptive pattern where they have, you know, something like a like maybe he's copying a rock, and this modeled pattern, and then this uniform pattern. And different um, different backgrounds will will they'll create different different patterns. Um, and those three, according to Roger Hanlon, who studies cuttlefish, are, are enough to blend in. Uh, he thinks that pretty much those three abstract nouns can kind of describe uh, all types of animal camouflage. So I don't, I don't know. I think that's an interesting idea. Um, I should note cephalopods can do other stuff. They have, they can either be flat or they can have stuff poking out all over. They can display motion. So they have a little more option than that. But okay, so here's a beautiful blanket octopus. Um, my friend does embroidery and she showed this to me. It's so beautiful. Um, and I just was thinking about how right she is according to Christopher Alexander's uh, 15 fundamental properties or 15 properties of beauty or wholeness. Um, one of the things she's doing that I had a hard time seeing before this sort of trans transformation was, was gradients. Um, I, I could get, a, get into some of the others, but I'm just kind of, she's, she's doing everything right. Um, if you were like me and you just thought in terms of color, uh, like, well, she's doing, she's doing orange and purple. I guess orange and purple look good together. Uh, and then you might come up with something like that, <laughs> which is not beautiful. And so why, why is she so beautiful? And this is so ugly. There's both orange and purple there. Well, that was, this was the big uh, revolution in my understanding of color. Um, there's this, this uh, from, from the Tao Te Ching, the, the five colors blind the eyes, uh, meaning I was seeing in terms of orange, well, I see orange, I'm going to put orange in there, uh, but I wasn't really seeing what was there. Uh, and I like the idea that the five factors of personality blind the heart. That there's these, uh, maybe if you, if you have this, in, this uh, in general knowledge of the five factors of personality, that maybe there's, there's an analogy with the colors kind of taking away your ability to see color. More useful abstract nouns that I've gotten from, from painters, like painting teachers on YouTube, largely, <laughs> uh, hue, like, is, is kind of which color, but, but also, um, I guess they include like warmth and coolness and that saturation was the one that really blew my mind that I, this is maybe how ignorant I was <laughs> uh, that I didn't understand this, that very saturated colors like bright orange um, have a hard time working with other colors. Whereas a more muted orange um, can, can work with, with other colors and that browns and grays, very, very desaturated colors uh, can form a stronger basis to display little bits of more saturated color. So color harmony is, is a little bit, um, I think I understand it now, but it's a little hard to explain. We'll see, we'll take a couple trips through it. Uh, these are more useful abstractions. These are helping me solve real problems, whereas the names of colors were certainly not helping me. Uh, and here's a close up of that octopus. You can see her purple isn't even purple. There's blue, there's magenta, they're mixed together at a close level. The orange isn't orange, there's yellow and brown. Uh, mixed together in a modeling pattern. Um, there's no straight lines. There's the, everything is a gradient. Everything is mixed together. Uh, it's so beautiful, but it's definitely not uh, this. <laughs> that's that's what I was seeing before. Okay. All right. So more more unlearning color. Um, color harmony has to do with how well colors go together, right? I think my my orange and mint green shawl is is not a great example of color harmony. But the, it's the idea that color isn't absolute. There's no color, there's no orange in general. It's relative. It depends on what's nearby it, uh, what light is shining on it. One, I, I could not find the source for this, but it's just from a YouTube video, Master Weaver. She said, uh, basically all colors look together if they have some indigo in them. Like if you put everything in indigo, they all look, look better. Um, Cause they have, they have color harmony. They're closer together. They have the same thing showing up over and over. Um, the other thing was just that you could mix every color from just a few colors. Like the painters don't have a million different paints on their uh, on their palette. I'll I'll talk about that in a bit. But um, you just need a few colors, and you can mix kind of any color. Okay, so so one effect, and you could probably see this from the pictures I chose that I'm interested in is luminosity. Like those 
clouds that just glow and the sky is like shining and that experience, like what that feels like is something that I, that I'd love to communicate. Um, Christopher Rothko said about his father, Mark Rothko's paintings that he uses one color as a veil for another color to shine through. So he's, he's getting that luminosity effect. And YouTube painting teacher, Diane Mize, her channel I think is in the studio art instruction. She explains it. She's like, well, I'll tell you the trick. Okay. So at least one way of doing it is putting near values together. So not value is like whether it's dark or light. So colors that are about the same darkness and lightness next to each other with a variation in saturation or hue. So a little little yellow, like yellow with a little more grayed down yellow or orange with a more grayed down orange or something that's maybe yellow next to orange, but the, the interplay of the two. So it's not a flat color. The luminosity comes from different colors together. And it's, it's heartening. This is a, a Bierstadt painting of Yosemite Valley, I think to know that this is possible. People are doing this in 2D. Uh, people are getting this beautiful luminous effect in, in two dimensions. So it's at least possible. Um, seems like it's especially likely with, with form, like maybe all these rocks are necessary and this, these clouds, can I do this with something as abstract as knitting? Um, but one, one way I looked at the, the comment about the glow from near values um, is what if you just took away all the saturation? So you can kind of see this, if you look at the very top of the, um, of the painting, there's some orange clouds, the very top middle of the frame. With full saturation, they definitely glow and they, they glow off of this rock coming off uh, on the left side of the frame. Whereas with the saturation removed, this is just so you can see the differences in values, but not the, the saturation next to each other it's just dead, all that glow is gone. That glow comes from something to do with the saturation that's not present in just the values. So I think that's that's a hint that, that Diane Mize is right, at least about one way of doing the glow. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, here's just a close up. you can see the brush strokes. I just think it looks great. <laughs> this, yeah, there, there are a lot of uh, close values. It, it, it looks pretty flat and dead in the black and white one and the one without the saturation but uh, there is a lot of variation in the, the one on the left. Okay, um, here's, here's just a detail from my photo. You can kind of see the same thing. There's this yellow to white uh, variation that really glows out and all this yellow and gray down. And a lot of that glow is lost when you, when you uh, desaturate it. Um, here's uh, George Innes. Uh, I think it's Sunset at Etreta and a, a Rothko of unknown provenance. <laughs> I think these are about the same thing. These are doing doing a similar thing. I'm not saying it's a landscape, the, the Rothko is a landscape, but that you can communicate luminosity with minimal form. This is exciting to me. Uh, you can communicate even, I think, emotion with minimal form. And you might say, well, Rothko, you know, it's just a, it's just a blue square over an orange square. But if you paint a blue square over an orange square, you quickly see that it's not. <laughs> that, um, and we can, we can look at the luminosity effects, even in these abstract non-representational paintings, uh, the same thing going on at the, the lower left of the yellow square. There's a lot of interplay of differences in saturation that are not reflected in the value. And a lot of that oh, glow is, is lost in the desaturated version. Uh, even the blue has a glow to it, uh, luminosity that's, that's lost without, without the saturation. So this is exciting to me because with knitting, you don't have access to a lot of form, um, at least the, the kind that, that I do. So that's, that's interesting to me. Uh, just a, another Rothko that um, it looks, it, you'd almost think it's a monochrome, but it's super not. Here it is desaturated. There's all kinds of colors in there. So, and here's just, this is just kind of an idea of how, how tricky this is. These are just two different images of the same Rothko. I don't know which is the true one. They have different saturations, but maybe we can get something. It's pretty hard to find uh, high resolution scans of these. So you just have to go look at it. I do, I recommend just standing in front of it and sobbing. Um, all right, so uh, there's another thing to unlearn. So I had to, I had to kind of unlearn color so I could even see it, but then what could I do with it? Because with knitting, you're kind of just using yarn. And I had this idea, even though I spin, this is some of my early spinning on the left. And then this is my current work on the right. You can see how, how sort of chunky, it's pretty colors, but it's just kind of random. I didn't design this, this colorway. 
And uh, I wasn't thinking in terms of connecting it to any finished piece. I was thinking of them separately. And what I've been doing lately is spinning specifically for a particular piece, uh, forgetting about colors, trying to think about how do these colors go together? How do, uh, how do these support each other? Um, it's very easy to do a sharp edge in knitting. Um, you just switch colors, but it's harder to get a gradient. So um, there, and it's also hard to get sort of what I call fine grade control of color expression. You can have at most each stitch a different color. Um, you can have uh, one line, a different color, one row, but it's hard to do it at the, a scale that's smaller than a stitch or a row that's not up to just luck of dyeing because dyeing is really different from painting and then moving at appropriate scale because it's not, I'm not working in rectangles as you'll see, I'm working in triangles. So the, the big uh, insight to me was that knitting to me had been kind of like paint by numbers that you're just, you know, you have a pattern and you're sort of taking someone else's color expression or an almost haphazard random, you know, dyeing color expression Whereas what I really wanted was this uh, was like a palette knife and it's, it's Bob Ross's palette knife. What he's doing, he has all these colors mixed together and he's picking up a bunch of them at once and he's gonna put them on and each color is gonna show up. He's, he's not using just one, one shade at once. And so this was, this was my big insight. These dangerous looking instruments are wool combs. And this is how you uh, process fiber, how you mix fiber together wool uh, that's already been dyed in my case that that could be used as a palette knife. So once I realized the yarn isn't yarn, <laughs> once I was, became ignorant of yarn, then I was able to, to kind of have this breakthrough. So let me, I'll show you my method real quickly. Uh, this is just some wool. This is how it comes off the sheep. Uh, it's been sheared, hasn't been cleaned. It's disgusting and full of lanolin. This is on my yoga mat, by the way, which I made. You can see kind of another bad attempt at expressing the dawn and the orange light, but, um, so take all the, take some of the locks of wool, you put them in, I put them in little zip, zipper mesh bags like this, and then I dye that, wash them and dye them. So I, I have kind of like paint, I have boxes of colored wool, and then I put them on the, um, on the wool combs and I can mix any color I want. Um, some examples of different kind of brightly colored, this is early, so these aren't, these aren't washed ideally, but, um, you can see how the, the orange and the blue come together to make this gray, very neutralized color. And all these, these other colors, they start out very bright. Um, they neutralize down, but you can still see little remnants of them once you spin it up. You can still see, it, see the individual colors identities coming through. And the mixes, if there's three colors, you can see mixes each way. Um, this is how it looks like mid-project. This is the most recent one. Little, little balls of what's called roving. Um, and that's just what you get when you when you comb the wool. And then the, the finished product, the, the yarn skein ready to be did it is on the right. Um, let me just quickly run through the, the shawls very quickly and then we can we can go into questions. So so this was my this is my um, big big thing of being able to add back information. Here's just an overview of the technique. We don't need to get into that. Uh, this is my early work with just dyeing in the roving and it's it's pretty, but there's only so much you can control with that. Dyeing is not really the same as painting. Um, here's my first one that was uh, made in the new method. And it's, I think, I don't think it has much of a being. It's kind of, it's all right, it's kind of ugly. Um, but this, the really successful thing was a soft transition between the, the orangish brown and the grayish uh, stripe, which is was made from mixing the two together. So I was like, oh, you can just, <laughs> mix them together like you're mixing paint. Uh, this one was just color practice, basically trying to hit particular colors. I put some frogs in there because it doesn't matter. Um, and then this was my proof of concept that you could get this luminosity effect in yarn. So this just strips away every design element other than the color. Um, it's just, it's nothing but color. And I think the, I don't think it's a Rothko, but I, you don't necessarily want somebody, you know, staring at your shawl and crying. That wouldn't be a successful shawl. But I think it gets some of the luminosity without form. Uh, it kind of looks more like it belongs in nature than, than my other stuff, certainly more than the, the, the earlier orange bee shawl. Uh, here's my most recent one. Really happy with this one. Um, you can see the, the streakiness. It almost looks like a landscape. Uh, was not able to do this with the paint by number method. 
Uh, you can, it's, it's even hard to, to get the camera to show all the colors because they're so, uh, there's sort of this golden copper on the outside. Really, really happy with this one. Um, here's, you can kind of see the, the ugly shawl and the good shawl, the current favorite next to each other. Just one looks like nature and one doesn't. Um, and then, okay, I'm going to unshare my screen. and take some questions. Awesome. Uh, so if you have any questions, start throwing them in the chats right now. A anybody hear any echo? I just wanted to double check. Uh, no more echo? OK, cool. Um, some people were uh, coming in late, Sarah. So I was wondering if you can do like an elevator pitch on some of the key points um, of, of what we talked about today, or what you talked about today in your, your presentation. Um. Let's see. So there's no there's no such thing as knowledge in general. Um, surveys are fake. <laughs> um, let's see. Abstract nouns are everywhere, and they're they should not be abused. They should be protected. Um, it's hard to make beautiful things. It's hard even to see beautiful things. Trying to copy them is one way of seeing. Um, color isn't real. Yarn isn't real, and knitting isn't real. And that's <laughs> that's my summary. <laughs> Cool. Um, so I'll circle back while the questions start populating. Okay, here's one. Um, Allison, you had a question. If you can unmute yourself. Pat, if you want to ask. Yeah, uh, thanks for the talk, Sarah. Um, I had a question, which is uh, what kinds of nouns are indexicality and abstract nouns? What kinds of nouns? Indexicality, yeah. is, an, indexicality is an abstract noun, ironically. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I don't. I don't know. There, every time someone tries to come up with a with a term for it, it's like, well, what's not that? That's always the issue. Like, what does it distinguish away from? I think almost all words are that. So, yeah, everything's the same. <laughs> all right, um, Adam, you're next. Uh, hi, I'm also Allison. Hi. Um, your description of this like indexical like global problem solving with a craft um, really resonates with me. But I'm wondering like if you have any ideas how to do that with science. Um, yeah, the the ethno methodology idea is that you really get yourself embedded into some kind of reality. That instead of trying to get at things with with easy methods like surveys and laboratory protocols, little games and things like that. Um, and you might even be tempted to do like priming studies, at least priming studies, not a survey, right? There you're testing something like, um, I would say just get really specific. I wanna know like the science of how this one particular group works more than I wanna know something in general. I think that's, that's the only real thing. If you're talking about social science, um, I think I used to just want to know things in general. And now I think it's it's much more likely to be true if it's real specific. <laughs> like if it's just this one, uh, maybe this one family or this one company over a period of three years or something. That's, I guess that's that's one thing I would do. Any follow-up question? All right, uh, da, da, da. Alexis, you had a question. I guess I have a question. It's also a bit of a hunch, and I was wondering if you share that hunch or have a thought on it, and and why um, people have a strong tendency to uh, make so much of abstractions and maybe try to overextend them or use them in a sloppy way. And do, do you have the feeling, as I sometimes do, that this is because when you've made an abstraction, the abstraction feels like a, a concrete thing that can be manipulated just like the concrete things you're avoiding. Um, and I don't know. So there's, there's some sort of a hint there about a way not to do it and a way to do it right or wrong. I was wondering if you had thoughts in that direction. I think that's that's a good expression of what I mean by by ignorance uh, the, uh, that should be pursued is that, yeah, the once you have an abstraction, you think, oh, that's easy, that's solved. Like, oh, you know, we know about that because of some diagnostic criteria or something. Um, and yeah, I think it is. I like that idea that it's, it's metaphorically, it becomes concrete because it has a name. But it, it can be hard to, to keep track of where the abstractions are leaking. Um, but I, I think that's a good explanation of, it definitely resonates. And if any follow-up, uh, Alexis? Well, like a, a thing I notice is like, 
I, I used to be part of a, a theater company and there was a friend uh, in that company who had a lot of abstractions about personality. He, he wrote a whole book on like personality types and was flogging us all mm -hmm. to endorse it. You know, and I read the book and I'm like, well, this is, you know, kind of thin, like he's got this own little system, he describes it, and it all fits together as an abstraction, but there was nothing there I could use. But mm -hmm. the fact is, like, he was an amazingly insightful individual. He'd talk to someone for two minutes and he'd instantly, like, be able to predict their behavior and understand mm -hmm. them in very deep ways. So I sometimes feel when I look at abstractions that um, in a domain that's, like, full of context and indexicality. Abstractions mm -hmm. are useful because the right mm -hmm. person can use it as a kind of reminder for all the contextual knowledge that they have. Mm -hmm. And that's what he was doing. Mm -hmm. um, but then in like other domains, it's a lot easier, like in mathematics or something like the exact sciences, you make an abstraction. And then even without a lot of contextual knowledge, you can just hammer away with the abstraction and actually treat it as an independent object. And that works. Mm -hmm. and, and so when I think about this idea of abstractions as um, things that we mistake for concrete objects. I wonder if like that's the difference. There's places where they're good reminders that let you use your contextual knowledge. And there's other places where they actually do let you ex escape the context. Maybe that's a useful dichotomy. I don't know if that's how you think about it or what you're getting at. I'm, I'm not trying to offer a little lecture. I'm tempted, to... yeah. I'm tempted to say that even, even in math, um, it's hard to globalize. It's hard to... <laughs> It's hard to figure out what is true in all all domains at all times, and that's it's a, it's an ongoing problem. So I, I agree, math is an exact science in the sense that it's an ongoing accomplishment, as Garfinkel would say. They are dealing with how to abstract things, but they're at least paying attention to when does this apply, you know, what what shape is this, rather than in general. So, and yeah, I do think I think that abstract nouns can be really useful in context, like just because color wasn't particularly helpful to me or color names the you know saturation and and luminosity and value were really helpful so within within getting some some knowledge and understanding um, yeah the in in the indexical mode it's really helpful to have abstractions and to share them to to try to make sense and communicate what you're doing so people can use your experience cool uh, samuel you had a question yeah, I was wondering about what Sarah thinks like the worst casualties of abstract noun abuse are. Like, what are, what are we missing out? That's like the worst. What what's the worst thing that we're doing to ourselves by abusing abstract nouns? Is it just uh, like we're missing out on beauty? Is it that our science sucks? Is it something else? Possibly education, as an abstract noun and as a value that we allow the concept of education as a sort of wholly abstract noun. Uh, excuse putting locking children in boxes for years, um, stuff like that. Uh, yeah, psychology in general. I think psychology is one of how to. I don't. I don't think psychology is based on the abstract nouns. I think the abstract nouns are tools that it uses. So I think the basis of psychology is back, you know, 150 years ago when you're talking about uh, crazy people storage facilities. Basically, that's that's one of the problems of psychology. They're not they're not going from first principles or anything. So they're just kind of reaching for justifications. Whereas I think in, in education, the, the holiness of the abstract noun does, does a lot of harm. I'm not saying it doesn't in psychology, but things like diagnostic criteria, I think are terrible. I don't know if, I mean, the only, the only way to do better is like, don't generalize that much, but that's, it's not popular right now. Any follow-up question? Uh, no, that's great. Thanks. Cool. Uh, Stefan, you had a question. Yeah, I'm wondering if it would be, I guess, abstraction abuse if we use abstractions to kind of move from one concrete domain to another. And so I'll give an example, <laughs> be concrete. Um, thinking of like a, you know, when we dream of, you know, of, I don't know, we're stuck in a box or we're drowning. We're not, a, it's not a fear of water. It's probably the sphere of overwhelm, which is, which, is, which is a generality. But then we can then go down and kind of take, reify it down to a real life, waking life. What are those things that overwhelm us? So we do this sort of abstraction round trip. Um, it seems sort of metaphors do this in a way too. So yeah, how... I basically agree with, uh, is it, now I can think of his name as Hofstetter, uh, that, that analogy is kind of the core of cognition, that that's almost the only thought you can have, that this thing is like this thing. So it becomes, you can't just get rid of that. That's so rich and there's, there's so much there. It goes all the way down. 
So you just have to be careful about how far does this metaphor go? So for instance, I was interested in color harmony and I was trying to figure out, does it have anything to do with musical harmony? And is there, you know, is there some kind of relationship between integers down there? And there wasn't, but I also kind of found that those relationships between integers have less to do with music harmony than I thought. <laughs> There's mm -hmm. like overtones and overtones sound like color harmony or color harmony to me, not regular harmony. So, so yeah, I think, I think it can be really useful and generative to, to do analogies and cross domains. Uh, if you're keeping track of the analogy, if you're not letting them get out of control and just be an abstract noun and stomp on every other possible meaning. And would that be a fair judge of the value? I don't want to say judge, that's the right word, but of the value of that abstract noun is if you can reify it again in another way or not? Yeah, I think that's um, a lot of what people who are excited about like category theory, they're excited because you can use analogies in a lot of different areas of math. You can kind of see what shape things are. Uh, yeah, I think that shows up all over the place. That's, that's kind of like the core of what I care about, of what I think is fun. Is <laughs> when what's, what's in this domain that's the same shape as in this domain. All right. Um, uh, so Chris asks, we at the Stowe are interesting. Uh, are interested in mixing things. Uh, which disciplines, domains do you see are so separate that they would benefit by interacting with one another? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, beauty and everything. <laughs> um, <laughs> architecture and. I don't know how to describe it, sensation, like feeling. <laughs> um, that's, that's a good question. I don't, I don't have any cool answer for that other than I like the question. <laughs> All right, well, if you do have any cool uh, answers for that, you can always come back to the Stoa, Sarah. Uh, awesome. Uh, so we are at the bottom of the hour. Um, so I think we will um, end here. Do you have any kind of uh, concluding thoughts or anything you'd like to leave us with? Um. I feel like the, the whole thing made me, when I see beauty now, I can see it better. Like trying to make beautiful things that are like those beautiful things. Now I don't just see, you know, orange. I can see uh, transitions and I, I just, things are there to me that weren't there to me. And I think part of that is the new abstract nouns. So <laughs> just replacing them with better ones for the purpose of solving this particular problem um, was, was pretty effective. Now, when I look at something that would have just been mysterious to me, why is that beautiful? I can kind of feel in my hands with my wool combs how I would make that. So it's it's very different from just being odd. And I still, I'm not doing anything with like uh, perspective and space, but uh, drawing, I don't really draw. Uh, but it's it's something like I have some grasp of it, like literally, like these are my, this is a, this is a wool comb if you want to see one, it doesn't show up very well. But <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you so much for, for listening to this. I, I wasn't sure how it would go, I think. Um, it was pretty fun, a little bit rushed, but uh, thank you very much. And thank you for, for having me, Peter. And yeah, that's all. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Sarah, for coming to the STOA. Uh, you can, you're always welcome back. Second yep. fanboy, we can collectively fanboy or fangirl about you and your uh, <laughs> eclectic and quirky mind. Um, so upcoming events tomorrow, um, we have an event and I'm nervous about sharing this ugly potentially ugly poster now talking about beauty but this is uh what's happening tomorrow uh I like it it is <laughs> sarah approved it is maybe not the end of the world election party uh, so it's a 24-hour event we have uh wim hof uh, breath work we have a, a meditation election meditation uh, joe edelman is gonna do an election redesign Shame Breakthrough Bootcamp, Socratic Speed Dating, Existential Dance Party, Rap on Battles, Raw Sexuality, a lot of juicy stuff. Um, so it'll help us process that this crazy day tomorrow. You can RSVP to that uh, each event on the website, thestoa.ca. We have a Patreon and a Substack if you want um, daily updates. So that being said, everyone, thanks so much for coming to Stoa today. Thank you.